Bishop John Stowe on the self-appointed watchdogs and how he feels about them. I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk about it. I don't go searching out these blogs because they all have a, an agenda. It's not always the gospel of Jesus as their agenda. And I think you described well the self-appointed watchdogs of orthodoxy. Um, it's hard not to equate such self-appointed watchdogs with the Pharisees and the scribes that Jesus is frequently arguing with in the gospel, who are quick to point their fingers at others and quick to lay burdens on them without themselves offering a finger to lift their load. So I was not aware of this blog until I started receiving some emails from Catholics in our own diocese, I think very well-intentioned Catholics, asking for clarity. So, so we are compared to the Pharisees, right? Self-appointed watchdogs. We are compared to the Pharisees. And our way is not the way of Jesus, right? What is the way of Jesus? Going after the sinner, right? And we hear this a lot. Jesus is always going after the sinners, right? Where in the gospel can I find that? Where does Jesus go after sinners? I don't see that happening, right? I don't see Jesus running after the adulterous woman, right? The adulterous woman was brought to Jesus. The tax collector came initially to Jesus, right? The lepers, they were brought to Jesus. The people he healed, they were brought to Jesus. He didn't run after, I don't see him running in the Gospels. I don't see him running after the homosexual. I don't see him running after the adulterous woman. I don't see him running after fornicators, right? I don't see that. Where is that in the Gospel, right? You know what I do see is Jesus allowing sinners to make their own decisions, right? John chapter 6, a great explicit example of this. Jesus doesn't run after sinners. He doesn't go where they are. John chapter 6, Jesus speaks on the Eucharist. And the people that were there, the majority of them, they leave. The only ones who stay are the apostles. And Jesus says over and over in John chapter 6, he says, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And at that point, the crowd, they murmured among themselves. And they said, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And at that point, what did Jesus do? Did he retreat? Did he manipulate the language? Did he say, this is not what I meant? No, he got even more graphic. And one of the Greek words that he uses for eat translates into munch. Unless you munch on the flesh of the Son of Man, you have no life in you. And so he gets even more graphic, right? He doesn't manipulate the language like uh, members of the clergy do today, right? He doesn't say it's not adultery. It's uh, irregular situations. It's irregular unions. He doesn't say that, right? He gets even more graphic. He wants you to truly understand what it is that he's saying unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And they left. Did he run after them? No, he didn't. Can you show me just one example, just one, where Jesus actually runs after the sinner? Where Jesus actually goes with it? Now, technically, of course, we are all sinners. And Jesus was you know, uh, God, and so he was sinless, right? And so anywhere Jesus went, of course, he's surrounded by sinners, right? But he didn't go after the sinner. He didn't run after the sinner, right? If anything, he dismissed the sinner, right? The adulterous woman. He says, go, go. In other words, you're dismissed. Go and sin no more. 
And there's a reason why Jesus would never run after a sinner. Do you know why? Because he honors our freedom of will. This is essentially what he does in John chapter 6. He puts it out there. He lays it out in a graphic manner. And he says, there it is. This is the truth. This is the truth. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. No life in you. Okay? He lays it out there and he leaves it up to you. You make a decision. Right? He doesn't interfere with your freedom of will, your ability to choose. He doesn't interfere with it. And so he's not going to come after you. He wants you to come to him. Right? He wants you to make that free choice of you willingly coming to him. Take the priesthood, for example. The priesthood is a calling. You have a choice. As a person who is perhaps, uh, you know, seeking higher service within the church, right? You have a choice. God, Jesus, he puts out the call, right? The priesthood is a, a calling. It's up to you to answer that call. Jesus doesn't come running after you. Right? He leaves it up to you. He honors your freedom of will. And of course, you've got the parable of the lost sheep. Right? Everybody points to that and says, you know, Jesus will leave the 99 in, in order to go after that lost sheep. Right? Where is there an example of that? Right? You know, if you read any Bible study that I've ever been to, right, one of the important elements of understanding the Bible, as far as Catholics are concerned, right, is that you read the footnotes, right? If you read the footnotes to the parable of the lost sheep, it simply states that Jesus is trying to drive the point home that Jesus is concerned for his flock. It doesn't say he goes after his flock or a member of the flock. It doesn't say that at all. Right? It says that he tells this parable in order to show concern. Do you know that he is concerned and that God rejoices when one sinner repents? Again, repent. When you repent, what do you do? You return to God. And so ultimately, it's up to you. It's up to you to return to God, right? Jesus, is not, he's not going to come running after you, right? But this is the excuse, essentially, that Bishop John Stowe uses to justify the fact that he is going to participate in this event with New Way's ministry, that he is going after the sinner, right? It's not his job to go after the sinner, right? It's your job, and I say this humbly and with respect, it is your job as a bishop, as a member of the clergy, to state the truth of the Catholic Church as it has been given to us by Christ himself, put it out there, and they can either accept it or not accept it. This is what Jesus did. John chapter 6 puts out the teaching of the Eucharist. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And he gets graphic with the language. He makes sure that they understand his meaning and they understood his meaning because they left they walked away but he didn't run after them he didn't leave the twelve to go after the rest of them did he if anything he turned to the twelve and he asked do you also want to leave 
he gave them a choice as well. He doesn't intervene with your freedom of will. He doesn't go running after you. He doesn't try to change your mind. He doesn't try to change your will. He lays out the truth as graphically as he possibly can and then he allows you to make a choice. He doesn't walk into the den of thieves. He doesn't walk into a, you know, a, a, a whorehouse, right? He doesn't do that. He allows the prostitute to come to him. He allows the adulterous woman to come to him. He allows the sinner to come to him. And he doesn't shoo them away. He sits down with the sinner when they come to him, right? But he doesn't go running after the sinner. As we are led to believe today by these uh, spineless members of the clergy, right? Who have no spine, who do not have the guts that Jesus had and will not lay out the truth and set it out there and say, this is the truth. You can either accept it or reject it. 